The general pattern of life is that you get a body, and as it grows you find you can do more and more things with it. Your sense of who you are and what you're capable of doing gets more and more expansive. And then it gets turned around the other way. You start losing some of those faculties. And it's different for each of us, which faculties we lose at what rate. But what's the same for all of us is a sense of confinement. Things that you used to be able to do, now you can't do anymore. And you look ahead and you see it's going to be more and more like that. You get more and more pinned in, penned in. Fortunately, the story of the body isn't the whole story of your life. You have the mind, and part of your mental functions do depend on the brain, which, like the rest of the body, develops and then turns around and goes the other way. But some aspects of the breath, <coughs> some aspects of the mind, don't seem to be dependent on the brain. And that's what we want to work on developing those aspects and strengthening those aspects. The strength of the mind doesn't have to deteriorate with the strength of the body. As you notice, the body's wearing away. It's a warning. Okay. This is going to end at some point. And so you want to get the most out of it while you can. There's a story of a woman who went with her friend one time to see John Mahabua. The friend had cancer and was dying, and wanted to spend at least some of the last months of her life meditating. And the friend, who had been a doctor before she retired, went along. Then at the end of the time they had lots of tapes of Dharma talks, and so she, she decided that she would see how much of the transcribing she could do herself, even though she was in her 80s. So even with the limitations of an older body, she found that she could do a lot of good. Instead of railing against the things you can't do, you have to look at what you still can do and try to do that as best you can as a way of getting the most use out of this body before you have to leave it. It's one of the reasons why we have the contemplation of the body into 32 parts. It's not to make you think that the body is a horrible thing simply that the important aspect of the body is not in how it looks or how attractive it is. It's the good you can do with it. And as you find yourself more and more confined, as disease sets in and as aging sets in, keep reminding yourself there are still some good things you can do with the body. And one of the most important, of course, is using it as a way to develop good qualities of the mind, and through being generous, being virtuous, and especially through the meditation, because you can develop strengths of mind that don't have to depend on the strength of the body. There's the strength of conviction, that the training of the mind really is important. This, after all, was how the Buddha found his awakening. Traditionally, they talk about conviction being conviction in just that. The fact that the Buddha really was awakened. But the implication turns around and focuses on you. The Buddha was a human being. He was able to do this with a human mind and a human body. He was younger at the time, but still. There are a lot of older people who gained awakening in the Buddha's time, and all the way up to the present. And even those who don't get awakening find that they benefit a lot from all the effort that's put into training the mind. And John Sawat, after he'd had his car accident and was suffering some brain damage, could still tell when the brain was giving him wrong information and when it was not. That was the result of his training. One of John Fuang's students middle-aged man had to go in for a heart operation. When he came out, he realized the doctors had 
shut off an artery to his brain. His brain wasn't functioning quite right. At least had the presence of mind and the alertness to figure out what was going on. So he learned how to live with that as he gradually regained his functions. And he handled that situation much better than most people would. I know several of John Fuing's older students who had been meditating, and when they, two cases, had cancer, and they were able to deal with the illness with a lot more equanimity and deal with the pain without being overcome by the pain, again, because of their practice. So the practice does a lot. So even as the body dies, and there's no guarantee that because your mind is in good shape, suddenly your health will be your body will be healthy. There's that New Age belief that your know, disease exists only because you believe in it. That's not the case. D disease exists because you got past karma. You got a body. It's created out of fabrication. It's going to go. But you can make sure that your mind doesn't have to suffer from this. And part of that is accepting that this is the nature of bodies. This is the nature of karma. But there's always that aspect of present karma where you really can make a difference. That's what you've got to have conviction in. This leads to the other str strengths of mind. The persistence when you really keep at it. When it's going well, you keep with it. When it's not going well, you keep with it. You do it because this is the only way to escape the suffering that can come, that will come when aging and illness start closing in. When the results aren't coming as fast as you'd like, you find ways of encouraging yourself. This is where the conviction comes in. When the results do go well, you try to figure out ways of putting them to use. Keep trying to make the best use of what you've got. And it may be limited, but at least you're not giving in to the limitations. You're pushing against them. From here you get into the qualities directly related to the meditation, mindfulness, concentration, and discernment. Mindfulness means keeping something in mind. You practice it together with alertness. And what you need to keep in mind, of course, is the fact that the training of the mind is the most important thing there is. When you look back on your life, you want to be able to see that you develop some of the perfections, the same perfections that make ordinary people into arahants that made the Prince Siddhartha into a Buddha. That's a good legacy from each human life. That's what you want to be able to look back on. You develop more generosity, virtue, persistence, endurance, determination, goodwill, discernment, equanimity, all these good qualities. These are your real treasures. That's what you want to keep in mind, that true worth of a human life lies in that, the quality of the mind, the quality of the heart. When you have that conviction, then the mindfulness grows into concentration. From the concentration, you learn how to nourish the body with the breath. So you can counteract, at least to some extent, the effects of aging, the effects of illness. Having the breath as an alternative place to Put your awareness, puts the mind in a much better mood. And when the mind is in a better mood, it doesn't make the illness <clears throat> doesn't make the illness worse. It actually can improve the quality of the health. And even if the body is going to die, the fact that the mind has a better place to stay, just with the sense of awareness itself that develops as you focus on the breath, and you learn how to make that distinction with your discernment. Okay, here's the breath. Here's the awareness. The awareness is present right here. And even though it touches these things, it's aware of these things as the body deteriorates and decays. 
the awareness itself doesn't have to be affected by that. That's a sign of a really well-trained mind, and a mind that's gotten the most out of the fact that even though the body's aging, there's still good things you can do with it. Maybe not the things that you had planned, but then again, maybe your plans weren't all that wise. This is why we have the teachings of the Buddha to remind us that the goodness of a human being doesn't lie in having a healthy body, it lies in having a healthy mind. There's that story of the old man who went to visit the Buddha, and he'd been ailing. And the Buddha said, well, at the very least, make sure you're, even though the, the body isn't healthy, make sure your mind is healthy. And then before leaving the monastery, the man went to see Sariputta. Sariputta said, oh, you look like you've heard a Dharma talk from the Buddha. And the man said, yes. So Sariputta asked him what it was, and the man said, the Buddha said, even though the body isn't healthy, the mind can be healthy. And Sariputta said, well, did he explain how you do that? The man said, no, I was just struck by the thought. So Sariputta explains, it's developing the mind to the point where you no longer have to identify with the body or with feelings, or perceptions, or thought constructs, or consciousness. So that when these things change, as they inevitably will, the mind is not affected by the change. That's a really healthy mind. So this is what we're working at as we meditate. Develop the concentration so we can develop the strength inside, and the discernment that goes with that strength. To get the mind in a position where even though it lives in a body that's ill, the mind isn't ill. It lives in a body that's aging, the mind isn't aging. Even when the body dies, the mind doesn't die. And it's not affected by the death of the body. That's a really healthy mind. And that's a direction in, in which we can all work, regardless of the state of the body. So keep these thoughts in mind.